Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard, and I am here with... Beth Howard. We're going to do a Bible study. We're in the book of 1 Kings. This is our sixth lesson, and it's an exciting lesson. Stay tuned. I love this story. I know you've heard it before, but I know you love it too. And a story like this cannot be repeated too often. Let's get started. Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. What a great story. It's one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. It kind of reminds you of David and Goliath or Moses and Pharaoh as he rescues, as God rescues the children of Israel from uh, slavery in Egypt. It's just one of those stories where it looks like uh, it's uh, one-sided and there's no way to win and yet uh, of course, our God always wins. Amen. Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest. And it's just not any contest. He says, whoever wins this contest will become the rightful God of Israel. Now, why does he say that? And the answer is because under King Ahab, the religion or the worship of Baal was made legal. And it was made co-equal with the worship of God. So if you were in Israel under King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, it was just as legal for you and just as okay for you to worship Baal as it was to worship the God of Israel, Jehovah. So what uh, Elijah says is we're going to have a contest because the God of Je God Jehovah doesn't like to be shared in a terms of God. he's a jealous mm -hmm. God. And so he says, I'm going to set it up. So who are the characters? in this story, and the answer is, by the way, it's, it, the story happens about 860 BC, almost 3,000 years ago. Ahab, who is the, quote, e evil king of the northern uh, kingdom, or, or Israel is what it's called, and his wife, who doesn't, uh, isn't really mentioned in too much in this uh, story, but she comes, uh, and she gets involved a little bit later when she threatens uh, when she threatens the life of Elijah. Mm -hmm. And then there are the prophets of Baal, and not just one or two. There are 450 wow. prophets of Baal that eat in the palace at the queen's table on a daily basis. And then there is the one and only lonely Elijah, who is the prophet of God. So I know this writing is a little small, but I got a lot to tell you about the, the God Baal. He is a Canaanite god, and he's the God of rain and dew primarily, but also the God of the storm and the God of fertility. And when you th think about it, the, the way the story is told about uh, Baal, it's that Baal comes out of, of underneath the earth uh, at the end of winter and he rains on the ground and he brings uh, the storms of spring and then he fertilizes the seeds and therefore the crops grow and there's this all this bountiful harvest. So he's he represents both fertility, new life, and all of the stuff that comes with spring. So he's kind of like the spring God, yeah. but primarily he's known uh, in the literature of the day as the God of rain or the God of dew because that brings life to the plants in the springtime. So Baal, didn't, and this is all uh, Canaanite religion uh, history, the, the, the chief deity of the Canaanites was a, a god called El. And it, that El goes across all, all tribes in Canaan and all tribes in that part of the world. And in, as far as the Jews are concerned, El it represents Yahweh. And you've heard the name El Shaddai, okay? So El is the God who created. So he's the creator God. Now Baal, according to this um, uh, tradition, defeated El uh, the God of creation, and then took Asherah, who was, quote, El's wife, and also Baal's mother, and he took her to be his consort. Kind of twisted. Baal, a.k.a. he's also known as Beelzebub, Whoa. is the God of the rain and the dew and fertility, and to sacrifice to Baal, most likely you would be sacrificing a pig, 
And then if times were really bad, for example, the harvest the year before was off a little, then you would sacrifice your firstborn child oh. to Baal. Now, we often think of Molech as being child sacrifice right. god, but also Baal, if things weren't going too well and you thought perhaps Baal was angry with you, then you would simply offer Baal your firstborn children. Mm. So later, Baal became known as Zeus under the Greek uh, pantheon, and then later uh, as Jupiter under the Roman pantheon. And in Jesus' day, he was known as the Satan or the devil. So that's kind of how the, the, the idol or the god uh, Baal kind of progressed throughout history. And today, uh, we also know him as, as the devil or as, as Satan. And by the way, he's just as active doing today what he did then. I know you can't read this because I can barely see it on the screen, but the place where this contest took place was on top of a mountain right there. I think the name of the city that's right beneath the mountain is called Haifa, and it's right there, uh, and it's, it's Mount Carmel, and it overlooks Haifa, which overlooked, which is right on the Mediterranean Sea. So from the top of the mountain, you look one way and you can see the Mediterranean Sea. You look to the north and you can see Phoenicia, which is where Tyre and Sidon are, which is where Jezebel was from. You look to the south and you can only see the nation Israel. So it was a border place. It was the perfect place for a contest. It was what you would call a neutral site. Okay, it was halfway between Phoenicia, which is where uh, Baal was really the god, and Israel, where God was supposed to be God. So this was a great place for Elijah to call this a wild contest. Okay, wow. so the prologue, God sets up the contest. Three years earlier, prior to this contest uh, being called by Elijah, three years prior, uh, God told Ahab through Elijah that there's not going to be any rain or any dew until I, God, or in this case, Elijah says, until I tell you, until I announce to you that there's going to be rain, there's not going to be a drop of rain in all of Israel. So I'm putting, it's going to be a, a just no rain whatsoever. Now, what, what's, the, what's the significance of that? And the significance is Baal is the God of? Of dew. Rain and dew. Yeah. So he's, he's setting up this contest. So all the Israelites who, who worship Baal to bring the rain and the dew, but worship God because he's their God of their ancestors, they're all like conflicted, but now they're about to go through three years of complete drought. So all of a sudden, their faith in Baal is going to get on a hairy, thin edge. They're going to start thinking, maybe... Placing our hope in Baal to bring the rain is not going to work out for us. And by the way, there were a whole bunch of kids that were sacrificed to Baal during those three years. Mm. I know. And then God hid Elijah because Ahab was kind of a cowardly king. And he never, when, whenever he got a message from God that he didn't like, he always blamed the messenger. So he was going to go kill Elijah. So God hid, hid Elijah for three years. And Ahab looked everywhere to try to find him so he could kill him. You remember uh, the scripture where he was fed by uh, ravens and he yeah. drank from a brook? Well, yeah. the brook finally dried up because of the drought. And then he was sent to, to live with the widow of Zarephath. And remember, she had a little boy. And then the jar of flour and the, uh, the jar of olive story. oil never went dry the whole time he was there. So for a total of three years, God hid Elijah and Ahab couldn't find him. But at the end of the three years, uh, Elijah walks in and he says... <laughs> <laughs> he says, okay, now it's been three years that your God Baal hasn't delivered any rain, so now it's time for a contest. So Ahab, so Ahab then sets up this contest with Elijah. He says, First Kings chapter 18, verse 17, there's a lot of scripture here. I'll try to go quickly, but I just absolutely love getting into the details here. When Ahab saw Elijah, when he got there after three years, uh, Ahab said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? In other words, he's blaming this drought on 
on uh, Elijah. And he says, I have not, this is Elijah speaking, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. In other words, it's not my fault, it's not God's fault, it's your mm -hmm. fault, because you have abandoned the Lord's commands and you followed the Baals. Mm -hmm. You married Jezebel, she brought 450 priests with her. Wow. Now, summon all the people. Now here's, Elijah's gonna put this contest together, okay? Now summon the people, so bring all the Israelites that you can get to the top of this Mount Carmel. He says, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Mm -hmm. So Ahab agrees with that. He says, Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. So this is how Elijah sets this up. Now he's got all these prophets there from Baal and Asherah, and he's got all these Israelites there, the leaders of the tribes, the northern tribes, and they're all there on top of Mount Carmel waiting for this contest, which they don't understand yet. And Elijah went before the people. So he stands up and he makes this announcement. He says, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, you should follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people didn't say anything because they knew what was going to, they knew what they were doing wrong because they knew the Ten Commandments and they knew God says to have no other gods before me. Mm -hmm. So basically, Elijah's giving him a choice. And we have that same choice today. Right. Now remember, this story is about the Israelites, God's chosen people. So it's not directed necessarily at lost people today. It's directed at us, his church. And that is... We sometimes put one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God, and we try to live that life as a divided, uh, in, in a divided mind, okay? Can't you. you can't really serve two masters. So Elijah went before people and he said that to them, but they wouldn't say anything back to them. So then he goes ahead and he gets into the details. He said to them, I am the only one. <laughs> The odds, yeah, yeah. the odds here don't look good, but we all know who's going to win, but the odds don't look good. There are 450 priests of Baal, and there's one prophet of God. And Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left, and that, that wasn't true. There were 7,000 that had not bowed a knee, and there were 100 prophets that were hidden uh, wow. and protected from Ahab, but he was the only one there, that's for sure. He says, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. I want you to do this. So he's going to set up the, the contest. He says, okay, I want you to get two bulls for us, and I want you to let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. In other words, let them go first. Let them choose the bull yeah. that they prefer. Let them go first for themselves, and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but don't set fire to the wood. And he said, then, once they've done that, I will prepare the other bull. I'll put it on the wood, but I will not set fire to it either. Okay, then the Israelites agree to the contest. So then you call on the name of your God. I'll call on the name of the Lord God of Israel. And then the God who answers by fire, he is God. It sounds like a simple contest. So you've got two altars with two bulls, one set up by the prophets of Baal and one set up by Elijah. And he says, okay, I'm going to let you go first. You're going to call on Baal to consume that sacrifice. In other words, to have fire come down and consume that one. And then I'm going to call on the God of Israel to come down and, and consume that sacrifice. He says, the God who does it, the God who actually answers by fire, that's, he is, you're going to be your God. Now, are you willing are you willing, if that happens, mm -hmm. are you willing then to say that he is going to be your God? Mm -hmm. So that was the choice. He says, I'm giving you a choice. You got to make a choice, one or the other. And it says, and then all the people said, and remember, before they couldn't say anything. And now they say, you know, we understand exactly what you're saying. And he says, what you say is good. In other words, we agree. We're buying in. We're all in. That's fair. So then the contest begins. Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, I want you to choose one of the bulls, prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but don't let the fire. fire. So the prophets of Baal took the bull given to them, and they prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. That's three hours. Baal, answer us, they shouted. So the way I look at it is a football game. The prophets of Baal score zero at halftime. Yeah. So it's not looking good for the first half. So then... 
uh, Elijah says, you know, you, you probably ought to uh, try harder. So, <laughs> try but, harder. but there was no response. No one answered. In other words, Baal didn't answer. And they danced around the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah began to talk. You know, sometimes in a, in a golf match, uh, if you're in a friendly golf match, you start doing this thing called trash talking where you just kind of kind of goad the, the person that you're playing against. And in professional sports, it's become fairly commonplace, especially in basketball and football. Okay, so at noon, at halftime, Elijah begins to taunt them. He's doing some trash talking. Shout louder, he said. <laughs> Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought. Or maybe he's just busy. Or perhaps he's on vacation and he's traveling. Maybe he's just taking a nap and you need to wake him up. And if you'll shout really loud, surely you'll get his attention. Wow. So, sarcasm. So it was. It was yeah. There's not a lot of sarcasm in the Bible, but this is probably the pinnacle of sarcasm or trash talk in a contest. Elijah's feeling pretty confident. Mm -hmm. Verse 28. So they shouted even louder, and then they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Doesn't sound like fun being a priest of Baal. So, midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. That's another three hours. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. This is the end of their game. This is the end of their turn. Their time is up. The second half has expired for them and Baal still has a score of zero, so now it's time for Elijah. Mm -hmm. Then Elijah said to all the people, get closer. Just come, come on, gather closer. I, just, I want you to watch what I'm doing. Watch uh, God just watch yeah. what's about to happen, he says. So they came up close. They came up real close to him. And then he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was already there, but it had been torn down, which had been torn down. It says that. Yes. So Elijah reminds the people whose they are. So then Elijah says, okay, I'm rebuilding this altar. I'm putting the stones back on top of it. And let me tell you what these stones mean. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying... Your name shall be Israel. So as he places each stone, he says, now I want you to remember your Bible Sunday school. I want you to remember your history. I want you to remember those stories that you were told when you were little. Okay, this is an altar I'm building for the God who brought you out of Egypt. This is for the God who saved you and brought you into the land of promise. This is the altar that I'm building to the God of Israel. Yes. With these stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed. Nobody really knows what that means, but it was kind of like a moat around a castle. It was a deep ditch that went all around it. And you're thinking to yourself, and I'm sure they were thinking to themselves, why is he digging a ditch around the altar? Well, it comes out later. So then he's saying, I'm going to do something to make sure that that you don't think you're being tricked. I'm gonna make sure that you understand that there's not a hidden fire going on, that I didn't sneak something in while you weren't looking. So he says, I, he arranged the wood, he cut the bull into pieces, he laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour that water on the offering on the and on the wood. And then he says, I want you to fill those jars and dump the water again. So he said, do it again, he said, and they did it again. He says, I want you to do it a third time. He ordered and they did it the third time. By this time, the water ran down around the altar and it even it filled, filled the trench. The trench. Yeah. So now you've got the, the bull, the meat of the bull is soaking wet. The wood, which doesn't burn very easily wet, is soaking wet. And now you've got the ground, which is soaking wet. And now you've got a trench, which is filled. And it truly does become a boat around the the altar. So Elijah stepped forward and prayed. Now this is Elijah's turn. Now he doesn't jump and shout and, and dive and cut himself or any of that kind of stuff. Look what he does. He says this prayer. He says, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be. And by the way, he uses Israel instead of Jacob here because the Israel was the northern kingdom. Mm -hmm. So he wants to let them know, I'm talking to you. You are God of these people. He says, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. And I've done all of these things because you, you told me to do them, not because it was my idea. 
I would never take this risk if, if, because it, you told me to do it. He says, answer me, Lord, answer me. And, I, and he gave two reasons, and I found this especially beautiful. Mm. He said, the reason number one, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are their God. And listen to this, and that you are doing this so that their hearts will turn back to you again. So not only are you doing it so that they will realize that you really are their God, but you're doing it so that when they realize that, they will repent and they will turn away from idolatry and turn back to you. That's a beautiful, beautiful yeah. statement. Well, what happened? Without delay, didn't have to wait three hours, didn't have to wait six hours, didn't have to wait for the next day. It happened immediately. The fire of the Lord fell and it burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the soaking wet wood, even the stones, even the soil, and it dried up even the water that filled the trench. It's a miracle. It was a total and absolute miracle, just like the parting of the Red Sea or David with a slingshot of the smooth stone. Israel is pretty clear now. Remember, for three years, their faith in this water and dew and rain God has been tested. Mm -hmm. They're pretty... He had their attention, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. He's pretty fed. They're pretty fed mm -hmm. up with this Baal guy to start with. He's failed them three years in a row, and he failed them because Elijah said God's going to put a stop to it. So they understand what's going on. And now they've just seen this incredible miracle, and Elijah told them he's doing it to show you that he's your God and so that you'll turn back to him. Mm -hmm. So he says, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and they oh, cried. Repent. Yeah. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Yeah. Then Elijah commanded them. That if the story ended there for us New Testament people who are kind of lovey dubbies, uh, we would go, oh, that's great. But it doesn't end there. But, but it doesn't end there for a reason. So follow me with this. He said, then Elijah commanded them, I want you to seize the prophets of Baal, all 450. Don't let any of them get away. They seized them and Elijah had them brought down into the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. There's a town right at Mount Carmel. If you come down off of Mount Carmel and you go just a short distance, there's a town there called Megiddo. And Megiddo is famous. It's famous because it's the site of a battle that will be fought at the end of time. Whoa. It's called Armageddon. And at Armageddon, you remember all of God's foes. All of his enemies will be killed. Mm. So this is just a shadow. It's a shadow of God becoming victorious because he comes down and he takes the sacrifice and then he kills the prophets of the idolater mm. uh, of, of Baal. Okay? So it, that part of it is a shadow. Mm. But it, it, because of that part, we can actually go back and look at the contest and the victory and we can actually see it a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Elijah then, so this is the epilogue. Now this is, this is the, I, I think this is the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. Elijah, Elijah then, after they killed all the prophets, now they're back up on top of Mount Carmel and Ahab is going, wow, that was amazing. Elijah then prays seven times for rain. And then on the seventh time, he sends his servant to look out over the Mediterranean Sea and the first six times, he didn't see anything. It was just absolutely blue sky. But the seventh time, the servant came back and he says, I see a cloud. It's about the size of a man's fist. Elijah immediately says, tell everyone to run. They've got to get off this mountain before the storm hits. <laughs> because if the storm hits, they won't be able to get down alive. You've got to get everybody off this mountain. And so Elijah was not going to stay there either. So Elijah runs ahead of Ahab's chariot. So Ahab hitched up his horses and took off down the mountain and they, they rode as quickly as they could to try to stay ahead of the storm that was coming out of the west. Elijah then runs. You've heard it said that the marathon was first run in Greece. 
from a, a messenger who took the news of a battle from Marathon, the city of Marathon, to the city of Athens. It was 25 miles. Now, today we call a marathon 26 point something miles, but that was changed only a few years ago. It was for a long, long time only 25 miles, because it's only 25 miles from Marathon to Athens. It was exactly 25 miles from the top of Mount Carmel to the city of Jezreel. And guess who ran the first marathon? It was Ahab, and he ran it fully clothed as an old-fashioned, got the garb, all that kind of stuff. He says he hitched up his robes, and he ran in front of the chariot. And the chariot, Elijah. yeah, he outran, oh, this is Elijah, he outran a chariot for 25 miles. Not bad for a guy who had never been in training. Remember, he'd been eating uh, bread for, and ravens have been feeding him for the last three years. He ran 25 miles. So for those of you who are marathon runners, that's not where it started. It started right here, 350 years before the one in Greece. Well, there you go. That, that's a bit of trivia. Elijah did it. Elijah did it. So what just happened? Number one, Israel were, was worshiping God in Baal. And Baal was the god of the rain and the dew. God decreed a three-year drought. Then God challenged Baal to a contest. God overwhelmed Baal and 450 prophets. Israel then saw what happened in the contest, and they repented, and God ended the drought. That's a pretty powerful story right there. And God did it to bring his children back to him and him alone. Israel was worshiping two gods, and God says, that's not going to be okay with me. God says, don't have any other gods before me. That's the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. Elijah says, I want you to make a choice. Either serve Baal or serve God. You can't do both. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You're going to love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. And James says, if you do this, you are double-minded. Mm -hmm. So we're instructed as followers of God, as Christians, to be single-minded, to worship God and God alone, to not get caught up in the things of this world, to not place our allegiance on the stock market, on, on cars, on houses, on anything other than our God, because he is the source of all that we need. Mm -hmm. And we, are, we have everything. I love the way Paul does it. He says, you have this in Christ, you have that in Christ, you have everything in Christ. It's everything you need, everything you could possibly want. Mm -hmm. This choice, their choice is actually our choice. Elijah demonstrated that Baal was nothing. He was powerless. He was worthless. He was useless. While God is creator, sustainer, all powerful. And according to Hebrews 12, 29, he is oh. an all consuming fire. Oh, that's a perfect fire. verse for this. It oh, is. <laughs> so good. Oh. Okay, God did a marvelous thing here. And I want you to understand it. This is our conclusion. He did a marvelous thing here, but it's not just this story. Wow. It's what this story represents. Back then, he sent fire down from heaven to show his people who he is. And 800 years later, he would send his son from heaven to show us who he is. Oh. Then... He did it to turn the hearts of his people back to him. And when Jesus came, he came for the same exact reason. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, that whosoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. Back then, he did it to turn their hearts back. With Jesus, he did it for the same reason. Then, he completely accepted the sacrifice that would have been placed on the wood. And in Jesus, mm. God accepted the sacrifice that was nailed to the wood. That was him. And God says, I accept that sacrifice. I take that as payment for your sin. Then he did it out of love for the nation Israel. Today, he does it out of love for you and for me and for anyone who would believe and place their faith in him. Everyone has a choice. We can worship the Baal of this world, which is the devil, or just the, the things that this world has to offer. We can look to whatever we think can meet our needs or make us happy or give us pleasure. Or we can look higher than that. We can look to the one who created us, who loves us, who loves us enough to die for us. That's where we place our 
allegiance. We serve him. We serve him alone. And we are not double-minded in that. God says, make a choice. Today, he asks us the same question. How long will you stumble between God and the world? You need to decide. If I walk with the world, I can't walk with God. They're not going to the same place. They're not walking in the same direction. I choose to walk in the presence of God. Pray with me. Father God, what a beautiful, amazing story for all of us who are sports fans, this, just the thought of that kind of contest and that kind of victory just kind of gets our competitive juices flowing. How awesome would it have been to be there and shout and joy of victory? And Father, thousands of years later, we read that story and we are smiling and shouting and enjoying that story. But Father, we enjoy the story of Jesus Christ even more because it's not on Mount Carmel, it was on the hill where the cross was put up. It's where he died. That's where the sacrifice, and that's where the, the war was ended. That's where the battle was fought. That's where Satan was defeated because you accepted the sacrifice. Father God, just give us a mind that's just yours. Father, take whatever it is that we've got that's allegiance, that has an allegiance to this world and help us to see it so that we can change it and just be completely devoted to you. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Oh, amen. I love that lesson. That was a great lesson, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Awesome story. Mm -hmm. Well, till next week, it gets even better. We got another, <laughs> we got another Elijah story, okay? I love that. I know I do too. You can call it First Kings, but it's kind of First Elijah here. <laughs> till then, stay safe, be well. Oh. We love you guys. Oh, Take yes, care. Yes, we do. Bye. Bye-bye.